Romans 14, verses 1 through 12. And the King James text today reads, Him that is weak in the, in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he is, he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Amen. I want to talk to us today on the topic multiplication and division. Multiplication and division. Will you bow your heads with me a moment? Master, once again, God, we come before you. The word of God is broken. The hour has arrived when the all-important task of preaching the word of God is at hand. And I need the anointing, the touch of the Holy Ghost. I want to be a blessing and an encouragement to every child of God that would hear my voice and would hear this message. Touch us today, O oh God, allow us to receive that which we hear, for it is not imperative only that we hear it with our ears, but that we receive it, O oh God, in our heart. Anoint the messenger today, anoint those that would listen, for we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name, Amen. amen. Praise God and amen. We're living in a time in church history when the church of Jesus Christ is going through some awful, terrible experiences. Some really horrible things are happening. People are leaving evangelical and fundamentalist churches uh, I've read a number of articles about how people are leaving these movements 
because of the division and the vitriol and the bitterness and the, the nastiness, the hatefulness, the homophobia, the misogyny, the xenophobia that we're seeing demonstrated in the church world today. What I don't understand is how people who claim they understand that the prime directive of the church is to grow. Jesus said as he ascended, Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel. He commanded his disciples, he commanded the church to go throughout the world and to make disciples. He said in Mark, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded thee. It's supposed to be the responsibility of the church to multiply. Am I telling the truth today? Right. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to tell you a little secret. People love to blame the pastor when a church is not growing. People love to say, well, you know, our church isn't growing. That, that's the fault of the pastor. Now I'm not saying the pastor cannot contribute to that being the case. He is, after all, the shepherd of the flock. However, I would also tell you today that uh, the shepherd does not multiply with the sheep. The sheep multiply with sheep. Am I telling the truth today? Yes, sir. You can't blame the pastor for your church not growing when you don't bring any visitors. You don't invite your neighbors. You don't encourage people to come to the house of God. I'm going to tell you, every believer in the church today ought to be engaged in the ministry of encouragement. When you see somebody is missing from the house of God, call them, send them an email, let them know you miss them. Ask them if there's anything you can help them with. You'd be amazed how many people fall out of fellowship with the church of the living God, and if someone had just shown they cared, if someone had just encouraged them a little bit, they would still be in the house of God. And I'm going to tell you, things don't multiply, things don't grow if you're losing people as you're gaining people. Am I no. telling the truth? If you gain 10 and you lose 10, then the fact is you've gained nothing. We oftentimes have had people come to our church and they'll come for a period of time and then they drop out. Well, everybody expects the pastor to follow up with them. No, sheep multiply, not shepherds. It would be encouraging to those if one of the other sheep, am I telling the truth, would call them and inquire of their health, inquire of their well-being. Are you okay? We miss you. We haven't seen you. I do follow up, but I'm going to tell you right now, a pastor inviting people to church, a pastor encouraging people to come back, it, it, people don't understand. Folks look at a preacher when he does those things and they say, Tommy, well, that's what he's supposed to do. It doesn't appear to them as an effort of extra care. It doesn't appear to them as any type of additional uh, compassion or love. No, because they look at it as being my job. That's simply what I'm supposed to do. I remember years ago when I was at Riverside Church of God. I got a job at one time across town at a McDonald's. I was only 16 at the time, 17. And uh, I got a job at this McDonald's. And I was working one day at this McDonald's. Now it's way on the other side of town from the uh, Riverside District, the Riverside community of Fort Worth, and all of a sudden in comes sister, brother and sister, uh, I, yeah, I can't think of their name, and their grandson, I can't remember their name right off the top of my head, but they were from the Riverside Church of God, and 
she had commented once about during the testimony service about how her grandson hated coming to church and she had a hard time getting him to come to church and uh, she said all of a sudden one day a young man moved down here from up north and she said uh, and boy I mean he worshiped God and he loved the Lord and he served God with fervor she said all of a sudden my grandson couldn't come to church fast enough said all of a sudden he's dragging me to church because he was my age he was the same age as me she said but there was something about this young man who came down from Connecticut that inspired my grandson to actually want to come to church he saw somebody of his own age who loved God and was sincere and was fervent, somebody who worshiped God with all his heart, and it inspired him, and it made him want to come to church. She said, and I'm so thankful for Brother Chuck. Well, I was just embarrassed. I had no idea this was the case, you know. But you know, you never know who's watching you. You never know who you could have an impact on. So I'm sitting there in church, Brother Sister Shields, that was their name, Beautiful holiness Pentecostal people. And they walk into this McDonald's with their grandson, about my age. And I was so thrilled to see them. And I, I went over to them and uh, I told my manager, I said, I need to talk to these people for a minute. And I went over and I started talking to them. And I said, y'all are awful far away from home. You know, what are you doing over in this neck of the woods? And Sister Shield said, well, we heard that you got a job over here. She said, so we just wanted to come to encourage you. Now, wasn't that sweet? They come all the way across town for no other reason but to be an encouragement to me. I'm going to tell you, if God's people acted like that, the church would lose fewer people than they gained. Do you hear what right. I'm telling you? You know what yeah. I'm saying? Mm -hmm. People, we would see the church multiplying. We would see the church growing. We would see the church fulfilling what is often referred to as the Great Commission. When I was a kid, there was one math class in high school that I hated with a passion. I don't know why, but algebra just rubbed me the wrong way. I couldn't stand algebra. I hated every bit of it. I saw, to me, it was the most useless senseless garbage that anybody could learn. I could not for the life of me, Tommy, understand how algebra was going to benefit or help anybody in life, you know. And so algebra just bored the flames out of me. And I hated it, I hated it, I hated every minute, seriously. I, I was terrible. Whew. I'm going to tell you a little secret, honey. Tommy will tell you, watch me with the television remote control and see if I'm telling the truth. Watch me looking at videos online and see if I'm telling the truth. I switch stuff constantly. I switch stuff fast because I get bored easily. I, I don't, if you don't get my attention pretty early on in the movie, you're never going to get it because I'm going to be over it and I'm done with it. I swear, I believe with all my heart, and I'm not joking. I believe with all my heart I have a touch of ADD, attention deficit disorder. Because you have to get me. You've got to hook me early or else you're going to lose me. Algebra never hooked me. And I, I, never, could, I never could find interest in it. Hated it with a passion. But I'll tell you, math in general, when it comes to addition and subtraction and multiplication and division and, uh, you know, um, fractions and all, I can do all that all day and all night. Don't have a problem with it. I'm very good at it. I'm, I don't have any issues with those parts of math. It was just algebra. I hate But you know, there are two mathematic sciences that I know for a fact you cannot perform simultaneously. You cannot multiply and divide 
at the same time. Mm -hmm. Multiplication involves taking what you have and growing it. Am I telling the truth? Right. Uh, and growing it by specific percentages and specific numbers. You multiply one by eight, for instance, so you're getting a specific uh, number in response. You're going to have eight times one is eight. But you've got, now you've got eight, where in the beginning you only had one. But division is taking what you have and cutting it up into pieces. Well, got news for you. Try to divide and multiply simultaneously. You cannot do it. They're at completely opposite ends of the spectrum. And yet today, the Church of Jesus Christ all too often is engaged in a fruitless and mindless effort to do just this. They're trying to multiply while at the same time they're trying to divide. It is impossible to multiply while simultaneously dividing. Division is separating and portioning what you already have. Multiplication is adding to what you have and creating more. Above everything else, the mission in the, of the church today is to serve as a witness to a lost and dying world of the resurrected Christ. We're called to demonstrate His love and His grace. We are called to be living epistles. That is today the only Bible which many unbelievers may ever read. The problem in the church today is that it is trying to accomplish a task that is impossible. It seeks to divide while simultaneously seeking to multiply. But you can't do both. We must decide today if we're going to do what God has called us to do, which is to multiply. And we must choose to abstain from the carnal and ungodly practice of dividing. Division is not a practice that the church is called to engage in. The church of Jesus Christ has never been called to divide. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, the apostle Paul writes, Now I beseech you therefore, excuse me, I beseech you brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 3, Paul writes, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal? And walk as men. Paul said that dividing and being divisive and uh, division, he said, is a carnal practice. He said, this is a worldly, carnal, ungodly. This is something unbelievers do. This is not something God's people do. The Word of God tells us that we have been called to a ministry of reconciliation. Reconciliation is bringing something together. The gospel is a message of reconciliation. It is not a dividing message. It is a reconciling message. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. Paul said, you're still carnal. You're, you're still walking like unsaved men. Why? Because there are divisions among you. Because you are still engaged in the practice of dividing. I'm going to get to my point more clearly momentarily, I promise you. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 18. For first of all, when ye come together in the church, Paul says, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. Certain in the Christian community today approach the faith as though it is a matter of absolutes. There is no room for disagreement or differences of approach or opinion. There is only one way to view women's issues. There is only one way to view LGBT rights. There is only one way to view gay marriage. There is only one way to view abortion. There is only one way to view politics. There is only one party that represents God. In this world of absolutes, they have created a breeding ground for division and strife between God's people. Those who approach certain social and political issues with a mindset of absolutes ignore the fact that in so doing they alienate and disavow millions of sincere believers who do not think as they think and interpret the Bible as they interpret the Bible. I had a pastor's wife that for many, many years of my life I've said over and over again, I believe this lady was probably one of the finest examples of a pastor's wife I've ever seen. Not Sister Gomes, she, she was, but it's another it's a pastor I had as a kid growing up in church. And this particular lady was the most sweetest, the, the most loving, the most compassionate, the kindest. Her husband, bless his heart, he had an unusual personality. And boy, I mean to tell you, he could rub you the wrong way. He rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. He Honestly, he turned a lot of people off. I hate to say it, but he did. Well, part of that is because people run around with their feelings on their shirt sleeve. People don't uh, understand that we're not, the church of Jesus Christ is not about division. We're about multiplying. We're about unity. We're about uh, reconciliation. Therefore, uh, he could say things in such a way that if you didn't know him, you might think he was being malicious or, you know, mean-spirited. But he wasn't because that wasn't him. That's not, and I understood that. So he could say certain things a certain way. But see, I grew up with a grandfather who was that way. I grew up with a grandfather who could just belt out words and say things in such a way, you know. And if you didn't know him, you know, then you would take those words wrong. You would understand them. And it always makes me laugh when people in the church, they'll be in your church, Tommy, for 10 years, and all of a sudden one day you'll have a disagreement, the pastor will have a disagreement with them, and he'll say something to them, and they rush off and never again do they come to church. Now, you've been knowing me 10 years. You know who I am. You know how I am. You know how I talk. You know how I operate. Oh, he was so hateful. Really? And in the 10 years you've known him, have you known him to be hateful? No. In the 10 years you've known him, have you known him to be malicious or to say things just to be hurtful or to, you know, to be offensive on purpose? No. But all of a sudden something is said that they interpret that way. Why? You see, so honestly when it comes to the art of communication, it is as much the responsibility of the hearer as it is the speaker. If you want to take offense at something somebody says, then there ain't no way in the world they're going to say anything in a way that you're not going to find offensive. Am I telling the truth? If you've made up your mind you're going to be offended at something they say, then it doesn't matter how they say whatever they say, you're going to take offense. And you and I know that there are people that are just like this. They're the kind of people who, man, they just constantly hear 
negative. They constantly hear critical. They constantly hear malicious. They constantly hear uh, mean-spirited. Why? Because that's how they want to hear things. That's how they interpret things. That's how they digest things in their hearing. So as a child of God, I know that those attitudes and those mindsets are carnal, Tommy. I don't hear everything as being malicious. I don't hear everything as being mean. Even if somebody says something that comes across a certain way a lot of time, if you give them the benefit of the doubt, chances are 9 out of 10, you'll, you'll find out that uh, what you could have interpreted one way was not necessarily the way it was meant to be interpreted. Do you follow what I'm saying? Well, this particular preacher's wife, every time you turned around, her husband kind of rubbed somebody the wrong way. And boy, they'd come and they'd just be in tears. Or they'd be upset about something he said, you know. And she'd come along and put her arm around that person and say, Oh, honey, oh, honey, listen, let me tell you, brother so-and-so... He didn't mean what you think he might, you know. That's the way he talks. He just says things very, it, and it's just the way he communicated, you know. And so she would be able to solve all of these wounds. That, and people would get past it, and they'd continue in the church, and all was well with the world. And because she was right, she wasn't lying to them, you know, she was telling them the truth. Well, I love this pastor's wife. A few years ago, one of their two sons passed away in a tragic uh, accident. And I felt horrible. I heard news of it. And I sent flowers to the funeral. And a couple months later, I'm looking at her Facebook page. And she posted this. You cannot be a Christian and be a Democrat. How stupid is that? I mean, come on. How stupid and ignorant and foolish and unwise was that statement? So I went to her and I said, Sister, you know my grandmother and my grandfather who tithed to the church that you and your husband pastored that I grew up in and they helped pay your salary and they helped provide a house for you and your children and they supported the church and they were as, as fervent uh, fundamentalists as anybody ever could be. You remember them? Mm -hmm. uh, they were also died in the wool Democrats and you couldn't get my grandparents to vote Republican if their life depended on it. When I registered at 18 years old as a Republican, my grandfather about swallowed his false teeth and disowned me from the family. He was so mad, I'll never forget it as long as I live. He was so upset. He was so angry and upset. Boy, I mean, he chewed me out, let me know the Republican Party was a bunch of, you know, I found out later he was right and left it, but we won't go there right now. My point is this. My grandparents were devout fundamentalist Christians, but they were also devout Democrats. Oh yes, even into the age of abortion, even into the age of gay and lesbian rights, because they believed that the Democratic Party represented better the values that they espoused, they believed in compassion for the poor. They believed in compassion for the stranger, for those who uh, immigrated to your country, for those who sought asylum. They believed in uh, supporting people and helping people to achieve their best possible outcome in life. You know, uh, they believed in supporting unions so that uh, people could represent themselves before their employers and not be taken advantage of and not be, you know. I mean, all the things the Democratic Party espoused, they believed in. Did they agree with everything? No. If you agree with everything the Republican Party uh, touts, you're an idiot. If you agree with everything the Democrats tout, you're equally an idiot as far as I'm concerned. 
Honey, you got to have a mind of your own. Somewhere along the line, there's bound to be a little point here, a point there, a point there that you may not agree with. But the idea is which party best represents the majority, the, the uh, lion's share of what you espouse personally. Am I telling the mm -hmm. truth? I got news for you today, folks. These fundamentalists who run around with all these absolutes. And I mean there are no questions. Everything in their mind is settled in heaven. Bless God. The word of God says. And therefore. Boom, boom, boom. This is what it is. This is the way it is. And you can't be a Christian and be a Democrat. Really. So what you're saying then is that the majority of the black Christian church is unsaved. Mm -hmm. What you're saying is the majority of the black church are not Christians. That's what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Because the majority of people of color in this country are not Republicans. Do you see where your mindset of absolutes is dividing? Do you see where your mindset of absolutes is setting up a false standard for who qualifies to be a believer and who does not qualify to be a believer or a child of God? Honey, you cannot multiply and divide at the same time. You cannot build the church of the living God while you're engaging in practices of division. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? What I'm preaching today has applications not only in the local church, but also has applications in the church universal, the church as a whole. That comment this preacher's wife made flew in the face of my own grandparents who were lifelong fundamentalists and diehard Democrats. Not to mention the fact that this mindset suggested that the majority of African Americans cannot possibly be Christians regardless of their faith, their profession, and their convictions because after all, they overwhelmingly tend to be registered active Democrats. What in the world is wrong with people who have been called to multiply when all they can do is divide? The mindset of absolutes, my friend, is not a godly mindset. It is a carnal mindset. You can try to justify it all you want to. I don't care how popular and how much of a celebrity Franklin Graham is or how much of a celebrity this preacher is or that preacher is in the fundamentalist community. If they preach absolutes and there is no room for disagreement. There is no room for difference of opinion. There is no room for difference of interpretation. Then, my friend, I've got news for you. You are following a carnal, ungodly person. You are not following a spiritual man or a spiritual leader. You are following an ungodly, carnal leader. Paul said in our primary text today, Him that is weak in the, in the faith, receive ye. <clears throat> but not to doubtful disputations. He said, listen, if somebody's weak in the faith and they don't understand everything just the way you understand it, you receive them into the fellowship anyway. Said, but don't do it to sit there and argue with them and debate with them. Why? Because all you're going to do when you do that is divide. You're not going to multiply if all you're going to do is debate and argue with people all the time. No, receive them, give them room. Give them time. When I met Tommy, Tommy grew up in a religious background that I have a lot of problems with. That's one of America's homegrown cults. And he didn't understand that when I first met him to be the case and all that. And to this day, I engage in practices 
that are very different than I used to do years ago. But I do things differently to this day to give him space and to give him room. You see, I don't want to constantly be pushing on him my convictions, my thoughts, my feelings, my beliefs, my teaching, my doctrine, my ideas. No. Give him room like anybody else in the church to come to an understanding on his own. People learn. That's why we come to church. That's why we worship God. That's why we listen to preaching and teaching. Because this is where we grow and this is where we learn. Well, honey, if somebody doesn't agree with you and you shove them out the door of the church because they don't agree with you, then what is the likelihood they're ever going to learn anything you have to teach? See, the problem is the church doesn't know how to act toward the unbeliever and they don't know how to act toward the believer either. Jesus said in Mark, go into all the world, preach the gospel, making disciples, he said, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded thee. Um, who does the teacher teach? A teacher teaches their students. You're not a very smart Christian if you're constantly out in the world talking to unbelievers trying to teach them how to live right and how to live for God and how to act right and how not to sin and how not to do things. No, 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 no. They're not your student. The believers are. The people who have come into the church are your students. Those are the ones you should be teaching. The problem with the church world today is they're constantly running around trying to force people outside of the faith to act like people in the faith. Am I yes. telling the truth? Yes. That's right. Well, honey, you're teaching the wrong student. That's part of the reason you're having a problem. And I got news for you. You're dividing. You're not multiplying. You wonder why people aren't coming in. Because you put the cart in front of the horse. Not going to go to somebody's house and try to force them to understand college level uh, teaching on various topics. No. If they want to go to college, they'll go, they'll register. There'll be an instructor there who is trained, who knows how to teach, and they will share their knowledge with that student. Am I telling the truth now? Mm -hmm. Amen. So you see, the problem with the church is, number one, we're trying to teach people who are not interested in being taught. And that's wrong. We shouldn't be doing that. Secondly, we ought to give people room to be in the church, but not necessarily have the same opinion, not necessarily have the same understanding, not necessarily have the same interpretation. Now, we're a one God, Jesus name. Church, we are a oneness church, an apostolic church. I don't apologize for that at all. I apologize to no one for our stance on our teaching concerning the Godhead. But have we had people of Trinitarian background come into our church and believe in Trinitarian uh, teaching? And uh, Sure we have. You know what? A lot of those people have come in, and over the course of time, they've come to understand our teaching, and they've come to understand what we're saying. Am I telling the truth? Now, I've also had some come, and over time, I had one young man say, uh, Brother, I'm not going to be coming back to your church because, uh, you know, I love it, and it's good, and it's great, but I just don't agree with your teaching on on God. I believe in the Trinity. He was a Hispanic young man and he grew up, you know, being taught the Trinity. Well, I've got news for you. What can I do about that? I'm not going to argue with him, I'm not going to fight with him, I'm not going to stand there and debate with him on it. No. All I'm called to do is teach. I'm not called to force you into submission and force you to accept what I'm teaching. Mm -hmm. That's how cults operate. Cults are all about forced compliance. So I got news for you. You look hard enough at the evangelical fundamentalist movement in America, honey, and they were a cult long before Donald Trump came along. 
Because everything's about forced compliance. Everything's about, you've got to believe what we tell you to believe. You've got to do what we tell you to do. You've got to be part of the political party that we tell you you've got to be part of. You've got to vote for the people that we tell you to vote for. Am I telling the truth now? What? You support gay marriage and you call yourself a Christian? You can't possibly be a Christian and support gay marriage. What? You believe in abortion and call yourself a Christian? Maybe that person says, well, no, I, I don't believe in it per se, but I do believe that secular government has no business telling women what to do with their body. And unfortunately, pregnancy, no matter how we view it as Christians, pregnancy is an issue of a woman and her body. Till that baby is physically born, it, it's up to that woman whether or not she wants that baby to be born. Do I agree with that? Do I support that? Do I like that? Do I encourage that? None of the above. But I do believe that secular government should not be uh, trying to mandate spirituality on people and force them into compliance with our view on certain issues. Therefore, I believe that a woman has right to do with her body what she chooses to do. Now, what I do think the church ought to do, I think the church ought to engage in everything it can engage in to positively, to positively and constructively encourage people uh, to do everything necessary to avoid unnecessary pregnancy. But see, again, here's where that whole doctrine of absolutes comes in. Well, the only godly way to avoid pregnancy that's unwanted is to abstain from sex. Hallelujah. Well, that's all well and good, but I got news for you. People outside of the church aren't trying to hear that. Well, they should. Well, maybe they should, but they're not. And since they're not, I'm going to tell them, honey, you can get an IUD, you can take pills, you can wear a condom. Oh, you're not supposed to say that, Pastor. Why, you're encouraging ungodly behavior. I'm not encouraging one stinking thing. I'm not encouraging nothing. But I'm telling people who are going to do what they're going to do, that if they're going to do it, there is a way to avoid becoming pregnant. If you avoid becoming pregnant, guess what? Then the abortion rate goes down. If you really don't believe in abortion and you really don't support abortion, then why don't you do what's necessary to encourage people so that they are not in a position where they even have to contemplate abortion? Mm-hmm. Oh, but we can't do that, Tommy, because we live in a world of absolutes. But can I tell you a little secret? The world of absolutes is a world of division. Paul, in our primary text today, in Romans chapter 14, he said, One believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. This is interesting. We've got Seventh-day Adventists that embrace a vegetarian lifestyle. They don't eat meat. And they'll tell you that's God's plan. That's the way it's supposed to be. Bless God. Hallelujah. Paul said there are those who eat meat. And then he said, listen, there are those who are weak who eat herbs. So what is he identifying the vegetarian as? He's identifying them as being weak in the faith. They don't understand this thing as well as they ought to. He said, but the one that eats meat, don't let him despise the vegetarian, and the vegetarian, don't let him despise the one that eats meat. Do you follow what I'm saying? Oh, is this about absolutes? Is this about forced compliance? Is this about everybody has to do everything exactly the same way? No. Paul is saying in this text today, the exact opposite. He's talking about compassion. He's talking about understanding. He's talking about compromise. He's talking about being willing to look past differences. Am I telling the truth? So that you can focus on that which you uh, on that with which you agree. Hey, they're a child of God. They believe the gospel. They've obeyed the gospel. They believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Our church has rented church space from 
an Episcopal church, doctrinally, you cannot find two movements that are more polar opposite to one another than the Episcopal Church, except maybe Roman Catholicism, and the Apostolic Pentecostal faith. We are polar opposite to one another. I got along famously with the pastor. Now they call him a priest. I do not believe in New Testament priesthood. I do not believe in calling any man father. Jesus said, call no man father. Uh, his parishioners called him father. I called him brother. When I'd see him, I'd say, brother, how are you today? You know why, Tommy? Because I disagree with him on 99.9% .9 of probably everything he believes concerning the faith. But I know he believes in Jesus. I know he believes Jesus Christ is the way of salvation. I know he believes that the blood of Jesus Christ is what takes man's sin away. Does he access the gospel? Does he preach the gospel fully the way I understand it? No. But the fundamentals, the basics, and I mean the most basics, he and I agree on. Therefore, I'm able to look past all the other and acknowledge him as a brother in the faith. Amen. Mm -hmm. Somebody said, well, do you believe he's going to be in heaven? I believe that's God's call, and I don't make God's calls for him. Amen. God said, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I got no business trying to tell people who's going to be in heaven and who's going to hell and who. Uh-uh. That's not my call. Now, if you ask me, what must I do to be saved, like they asked Peter and the other disciples on the day of Pentecost, I'm going to answer exactly what I believe the Word of God teaches concerning salvation and the way to salvation. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to tell you. If you ask me, do you follow what I'm telling you? But see, I'm not teaching somebody who's not my student. But when they ask, the Word of God said, then be ready to give an answer. Oh my goodness. Listen to me now, children. Paul said, don't let the one that eats meat despise him that doesn't eat meat. And vice versa. He went on further down and talked about, he said, who are you to judge another man's servant? Listen, people who believe on Jesus Christ become his disciples. They become his servants. They're not my servants, they're his. So who am I to tell the Lord which of his servants are acceptable to him or not? Which of his servants are doing things the way he wants it done or not? Am I telling the truth? Who am I to do that? I used to be old time holiness. I used to be clothesline. I used to preach hair, makeup, and jewelry. But you know what? I could go into a church and I could preach a message that was constructive and positive and inspiring that built that congregation up even if that particular church was completely worldly by my standard. You know why? Because I understood God did not send me in there to create havoc. God did not send me in there to create division. God did not send me in there to fix the pastor's wrong teaching. No, 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 no. That pastor will answer to God for what he teaches. My job is to be a witness and a testimony. If I do it right, then some of those people at one time or another may come to me privately or may come to me later in life and ask me about my beliefs and the way I do things and the way I believe things. But you don't march into another man's territory and start tearing things up. That is ungodly, it is uncalled for, it is uncouth, and it is carnal. See, it's all about boundaries. It's all about understanding your place and your position. Paul went on to say, God's able to make him stand. Let me tell you something. Don't you come into my house and tell my maid how to dust. Don't you come into my house and tell my cook how to cook. Got news for you. Um, 
if my cook is cooking and I'm happy with her cooking, if my maid is cleaning and I'm happy with her cleaning, then how you believe it ought to be done is no. It means nothing. If I'm happy with what they're doing, then leave it be. They're my servant. They're not yours. They work for me. They don't work for you. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? Oh, but we've got people in the church today, Tommy, who are engaged in 24-hour division. I live in a world of absolutes. If you don't do things the way I believe you ought to do it, if you don't believe the way I ought to believe, if you uh, that I think you ought to believe, if you don't belong to the political party I think you ought to belong to, you're not a child of God. You're not saved. You can't possibly be a Christian. Garbage. That is not what the Word of God teaches. In fact, the Word of God tells us that people with that mindset are carnal and ungodly. Paul said in verse 5, One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. We got Jehovah's Witnesses, bless God, we don't celebrate Christmas, we don't celebrate holidays, we don't celebrate birthdays. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, that's what you want to believe. I could care less. Don't bother me no kind of way. I understand the Word of God. I understand what I believe the Word of God teaches concerning these things. And I got news for it. Ain't, it ain't the way you're doing things. But you know what? If somebody comes into my church and they have a mindset like that, you know, and they've been convinced that that's the right way to think and that's the right way to believe, okay. You don't want to celebrate Christmas? I don't celebrate Christmas. I'm not going to have a hard time with it. I'm not going to throw you out of the church. I'm not going to discourage you from coming to church because you don't want to celebrate holidays. It's not that big an issue. It's not that important to me. Do you follow what I'm telling you? You've got to understand everything Paul is talking about here, though, he is talking about in terms of uh, understanding the law and understanding uh, legalisms. Paul said, no, there are some people who have one opinion on the matter this way, one understanding that way, one uh, interpretation in this regard. He said, others have a completely different interpretation. But it is not our right to despise and to uh, hold bad feelings or to exclude somebody just because they have a different opinion or a different feeling on a subject than we do. Paul goes on to say in verse 5, Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Tommy and I have tried to go and visit. We went to a meeting of the, this uh, fellowship of Pentecostal churches, we were invited by a pastor. We used to go to this church out in Garland and visit once in a while. The pastor welcomed us. He was very warm. He understood the nature of our ministry, but he was supportive. He invited us to go to this meeting, this fellowship meeting, that uh, uh, group that he was part of. So Tommy and I went all the way up to Little Rock, Arkansas to attend this three-day fellowship meeting. I sang in one of their services, and the people received it. They were blessed by it. They appreciated it. At the end uh, of every night, they'd go into the fellowship hall and have meals and, you know, visit and fellowship. We had a nice time for the most part. And uh, at one point, they were encouraging me, you ought to join our fellowship. You ought to join our group. And I said, uh, I appreciate that. That's very sweet of you. I said, but we have some differences of opinion on some issues, I said, and I would not uh, be interested in creating controversy or creating any kind of issue within this fellowship, I said. So it's best that we just stay out and we can fellowship with y'all. We're happy to fellowship with y'all, but, you know, we're not trying to join. See, I'm not trying to create division. I'm not trying to create issues. When we go and visit this other church, you know, in Garland, I don't get up and, and start talking about how churches ought to be inclusive and welcoming of LGBT people. I'm not going to teach things and talk about things 
that are divisive and could create division because that's the wrong environment. Those are not my disciples. Those are not my sheep. Therefore, they are not my responsibility. They're the pastor's responsibility. And if I try to do something over the pastor's head, I am not acting in a godly fashion. I'm acting as a divider, not a multiplier. Am I telling the truth? Well, later on, we went and visited another one of the churches in that fellowship. It was here in Dallas. Visited the church, had a nice time, went home. A little while later, I got an email from that pastor letting me know that I was not welcomed by that fellowship. I was not welcomed by that church. He had looked at our website and he saw what we believed in and what we embraced. And therefore, he was. they did not want us as part of their, uh, you know, to fellowship with them or what have you. Now, I didn't go in and say one word that was divisive. I did not go in and say one word that was controversial. I didn't go in and do or say anything at any time that would create an issue because I know that's ungodly and carnal and God does not approve of that. And yet they still decided, as Paul worded it in our primary text today, to set us at naught. Why? Because they disagree with us on certain issues. Doesn't matter what we agree on. What matters is what we don't agree on. So instead of multiplying, the man's busy dividing. Am I telling the truth today? I'm almost done this afternoon. Probably boring you to death, I'm sure. No. We are called today in the church of Jesus Christ to love one another, not to divide, to love one another. John 13, 35. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Romans 12 and 10. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. Romans 13, verse 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Galatians 5.13 For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 12 And the Lord make you to increase, and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. First Thessalonians 4 and verse 9, But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. Hebrews 10, 24, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. 1 John 4.11 Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Do you know in the Old Testament law of Moses, God called for the people of Israel to embrace strangers, meaning asylum seekers or immigrants as though they were natural-born citizens. God did not want His people dividing when adding people to their number was what He desired. He wanted them to multiply, not to divide. In order to multiply, if you're bringing in, if people are coming in who are asylum seekers, if people are coming in who are immigrants, the Word of God uses the word stranger for that, for uh, immigrants and for asylum seekers, then God said the only way to multiply is you've got to count them as natural born citizens. Exodus 12, 49, One law shall be to him that is home born and unto the stranger that sojourneth among you. 
Exodus 22, verse 21. Thou shalt neither vex a stranger nor oppress him, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. Exodus 23 and verse 9. Also thou shalt not oppress a stranger, for ye know the heart of a stranger, seeing ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. Leviticus 19.34 But the stranger that dwelleth with you shall be unto you as one born among you, and thou shalt love him as thyself. For ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 24 verse 22. Ye shall have one manner of law. As well for the stranger. As for one of your own country. For I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 25 verse 35. Listen to this and tell me this is a Republican party platform. And if thy brother be waxen poor, and fallen in decay with thee, then thou shalt relieve him. Yea, though he be a stranger, or a sojourner, that he may live with thee. So the Lord says, if somebody falls into hard times, he said, you're to relieve them. You're to provide assistance to them. You're to help them. He said, even if he is a stranger, even if he is an immigrant, even if he's not a natural born citizen. Oh my goodness, do you hear what I'm telling you today, folks? God's about addition and multiplication, not about division. Am I telling the truth today? Our God despises division. He's called us to live peaceably with all men and to be peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall inherit the earth. He is against those who sow division and who seek to create confusion and divisiveness. In Proverbs 6, 16 through 19, These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, listen, and he that soweth discord among brethren. Romans 16, 17 and 18. Now I beseech you, brethren, Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. This is why I don't go into a fellowship that believes differently than I do or believe, you know, has different positions on things and start saying things that are controversial, say, because Paul says right here, you don't do that. He said, you mark those who make a habit of doing this, okay? 1 Corinthians 3, 3 and 4, for ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal, and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? You see, people are all about division. I'm a Lutheran. I follow Luther's teaching. I'm a Calvinist. I follow Calvin's teaching. I'm a Wesleyanist. I follow Wesley's teaching. I'm a Jehovah's Witness. I follow this guy's teaching. I'm a... Uh, Christian scientists, I follow Mary White's teaching. You follow what I'm telling you? Oh, it's all about division. We gotta, we gotta determine. Oh, I'm in this camp. I'm in that camp. No, you don't have to believe exactly the way I believe. I'm still gonna receive you. I'm still gonna accept you as a believer. I may not agree. 
I may not be in perfect agreement with you, but God is about multiplication, not division. In James chapter 4, verse 1, almost done. One day we shall achieve perfect unity. Excuse me, James 4 and 1. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your own lusts, that war in your members. When there are wars and fightings among God's people, it is because the garbage that's going on in their own self has nothing to do with you being in the right and them being in the wrong. If your attitude is right and your spirit is right, there will not be this war and division. One day we will achieve perfect unity. One day the church will know what perfect unity is. In that same day, we shall attain perfect knowledge and understanding as well. <sighs> One day, Tommy, we're all going to be in the same mind. We're all going to believe the same thing. Because at that point, everything will be open to us and nothing will remain hidden any longer. In closing, Ephesians 4, 1 through 13. Paul writes, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit even as ye are all called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascendeth up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that, he as, now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended far up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. Verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, meaning complete or mature man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Read our primary text again and see what Paul says about differences of opinion and differences of understanding and differences of biblical interpretation and how we're to love and we're to embrace. We're not to set people aside because we don't altogether agree with them. No, if they have faith in Christ and they're professing Jesus Christ as Lord, then honey, I've got to give them space. I'm supposed to be understanding. I'm supposed to show them forbearance and long-suffering. Am I telling the truth? I'm supposed to show them patience. This is what Paul said in our final text today. Folks, God has called His church today to multiply, not to divide. You cannot do both simultaneously. Amen. Would you stand with me today? Mm -hmm.